Hi and a good day. This is lecture 6, still on the topic of field and laboratory methods. For this week, our specific topic is museum curatorship and molecular techniques. In the Philippines, traditional methods are still in use and often entails the capture and collection of specimens. Collections indeed, according to Patterson in 2002, are needed because these are studied by anatomists, morphologists, veterinarians, molecular biologists, taxonomists, systematists, and geneticists. Some species exhibit subtle characteristics, and so they need to be captured and examined to identify new species there should be a type specimen. To document and understand biodiversity, to establish benchmarks for setting priorities, and some species are small and inconspicuous, and also some species are nocturnal. Collections-based publications were studied by McLean et al. in 2016 and among about 1,400 papers published from 2005 to 2014 in the Journal of Mammalogy, so please take note that this is specific for mammals, they found that 25% utilized museum specimens. Furthermore, studies using only existing specimens were the largest, and significantly more studies utilized historical material in combination with newly collected specimens than studies only generating new specimens. In the graph, the black bar indicates the articles that used specimens already contained in natural history collections. Dark gray, those that used new collected material that was subsequently deposited in natural history collections. And light gray, those that used both. This demonstrates that natural history collections are critical infrastructure supporting substantial numbers of research publications and that use of historic specimens in addition to ongoing voucher collection remains an integral approach to many research questions in particular uh, to mammalogy. In the same paper, Research and teaching in mammalogy supported by the Division of Mammals and Division of Genomic Resources at the Museum of Southwestern Biology were examined. The graph here shows the number of loans in seven categories. B, systematics and biogeography, which is the highest. T, teaching, the second highest. G, genomics. M, morphometrics. P, parasitology and pathogen research, S, stable isotope analysis, and O for others. The inset shows the total number of publications supported by the division over the same time period. Again, in the same paper, this figure shows the large discrepancy in the fate of mammal materials obtained for research. In greater than two-thirds of papers that collected such material, it was unclear if materials were deposited in a natural history collection, whereas less than one-third reported completing this important step. They note that many of these materials would qualify as voucher specimens if properly preserved and asso associated with collection data. For specimens collected in the field which should have been properly processed and tagged and have corresponding information noted in catalog sheets, this may be further processed in an academic laboratory for identification or sent to museums for identification. Collected specimens should be deposited in museums, especially the holotypes of new species. Fukushima et al. 2020 recommends that the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature could require newly designated types based on recently collected specimens to be accompanied by statements of deposition in recognized scientific or educational institutions. Natural history collections contain display specimens, 
Study skins, as shown here from the Rabar collection of the UPLB Museum of Natural History, and also tissues. The Rabar collection is an important collection of wildlife specimens collected throughout the Philippines. Some of the specimens include type specimens from which various Philippine wildlife species were identified. The following slides I will show you are from the PowerPoint presentation of Professor Andres Tomas Danz, a PhD candidate from CFNR who is currently doing a dissertation on the Rabor collection. Professor Danz has given me permission to use his material. Who is Rabor? Dr. Juscoro S. Rabor, also known as Joe Rabor, was a graduate of UP and had a PhD from Yale University. He was a Filipino ornithologist, zoologist, and con conservationist. He is known as the father of Philippine wildlife conservation. Dr. Rabor led more than 50 wildlife expeditions in the Philippines. He authored 87 scientific papers and articles over a span of 50 years, from 1936 to 1986. He also described 69 mostly new bird taxa and some mammal and reptile species. Wildlife species have also been named in honor of him, like the tube-nosed bat, Nectimini rabori, the Visine rabdornis, rabdornis rabori, rabor's forest frog, Platymantis rabori, to name a few. His collaboration with natural history museums worldwide resulted in the most comprehensive collection of Philippine bird and mammal skins, from which many new taxa was described. A large part of these specimens are deposited at Yale Peabody, Smithsonian, Field Museum, and Delaware Museum. But majority of the specimens are kept in the Philippines and are housed in three universities where he held professorships, Siliman, MSU Marawi, and UPLB. Shown here is Professor Andy Dance during his younger years holding a study skin. Then on the lower right is the UPLB Museum of Natural History Building, which I hope you have visited, if not maybe after the pandemic. And then above, uh, which I have shown earlier, are the study skins of the Rabor Collection housed at the second floor wing A of the Institute of Biological Sciences building. These specimens have been used for my Wildlife 101 and Mammalogy Laboratory classes before. I don't remember if the first batch of uh, Wildlife 201 lab students were able to access the collection before the lockdown. But if you want to see the collection in the future, I will be glad to show the specimens to you. Some of the Rabor collection specimens are also housed in Europe, for example, in Germany, in the Netherlands, and United Kingdom. In New York, California, and Hawaii in the USA. Delaware, Massachusetts, Illinois, and Ohio. In Michigan, in Connecticut, in Washington, D.C., and in Kansas. So just imagine how many specimens were collected by Rabor and his collaborators. At that time, collection permits were not required. His daughter, who would join Dr. Rabor's expeditions during vacation, along with other family members, recalled that the forests were lush and wildlife abundant. This were also, there, were, there were also no danger from 
bandits unlike during these times. Museum curation involves the preparation of specimens, housing of the specimens, which involves finding suitable cabinets or drawers, and ensuring that collections are not damaged by insects and the elements, cataloging, arranging or organizing, and also the exchange and loan. We have a separate course for curatorship for wildlife collections, Wildlife 292. So if you are interested, you might want to take this course. Museum specimens, as you have learned earlier, are used both for teaching and research, and even just for plain appreciation. The Field Museum holds a number of Philippine specimens, specifically mammal specimens, thanks in part to Dr. Lawrence Heaney, who has, together with Filipino wildlife biologists, uh, the late Danny Balete and uh, Maria Josefa Sweepy Velus of the Philippine National Museum and Professor Philip Alviola of UPLB, has described numerous mammal species. So they have this site for use of the collection's data and images. The Field Museum collections, as an open data, wish to encourage scientific inquiry and debate, foster collaboration and innovation. The UPLB Museum has also been granted an award by the Biodiversity Information Fund for Asia, BIFA, to pursue a project to promote the mobilization and use of biodiversity data from Asian collections and ecological monitoring. This will be published in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF. The Field Museum also has a site for visiting the collection, requesting a specimen loan, and even for requesting a tissue loan. Most museums in developed countries use morphological and molecular techniques for studying species or populations. For example, in the Field Museum, they have several laboratories studying various aspects, such as DNA analysis, a bioinformatics center, a fossils lab, the Regenstein Pacific Lab is an imaging center, and they also have an elemental analysis facility. Your learning activity will be uh, the discussion forum. So read the article of Pacnia et al. 2015, Lack of Well-Maintained Natural History Collections and Taxonomists in Megadiverse Developing Countries Hampers Global Biodiversity Exploration. So the question is, there is an apparent lack of well-maintained natural history collections and taxonomists in megadiverse developing countries. Is this true for the Philippines? So this is your learning activity. Have a good day.